Joe, why don't you start? And then... Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Touch. I'm an independent consultant, uh, and my website is strayalpha.com, as you can see on this title page here. Uh, I've been um, a research professor at USC ISI for about 25 years doing internet research, uh, recently went to the Aerospace Corporation in El Segundo here, uh, and have been working on satellite networks uh, since then. Um, and um, my co-author here is Dave Farber, who was my PhD advisor uh, 27, 28 years ago. Yes, yeah. Yeah, uh, who is now visiting at Keio University in Tokyo. And we're going to be speaking about uh, rebooting the internet. The websites that you see on the, the page here uh, are up, and they are the best way to find me and myself and Dave. OK. So Dave, did you want to uh, give a brief introduction here? Yeah. Uh, I'm Dave Farber, obviously. Uh, I'm a distinguished professor at Keio University in Tokyo, Japan. Been here for two years. Be here at least the next year assuming that the virus doesn't destroy everything around here. Um, the, uh, besides being a professor at KO, uh, I co-chair with uh, Jun Murai the Center for Cyber Civilization Research Center, which is a uh, activity at KO that encompasses a whole bunch of activities from computer security to medical informatics, a whole bunch of stuff that relates to where our civilization is going courtesy of cyber. Uh, this subject of rebooting the internet has interested me for a long time. Uh, the Putting a little bit of history in this, the internet really started out as an experiment. Uh, you know, trying to do packet switching and trying to use that as a vehicle between computers. It was an experiment. And experiments have a habit of uh, sometimes doing things right, sometimes doing things wrong. There were a lot of issues that were just not considered when the, when the early net research was done, like security and a bunch of other things. It was hard enough to get the thing running, uh, plowing new ground. So in fact, a lot of things were, were ignored. The other thing that's happened is that we've gone from a world where we had you know, basically 56 kilobit circuits at best, to now where we have gigabit circuits at least. We now have wireless, which we didn't have back then, a whole bunch of things that have changed things dramatically. Some things have not changed, they've evolved, and the evolution may or may not have been always in the right direction. And that's one of the things we're gonna to explore today. And Joe's gonna give most of the talks, uh, most of the talk, uh, always put it on your former students to do that. Uh, I won't go there right now. So I'm going to turn this over to Joe. Uh, there's a number of things at the CCRC website, which is there. Some talks I gave at KO, which amplify some of these issues. Uh, so I'll be available for questions, and I'm always available for email. Joe? Take it over. And, and also to give credit where credit's due, uh, Dave had given a talk uh, back in, I think it was January, uh, yeah. at Keio University somewhat extemporaneously and sent me the video and asked what I thought of it. And I sent him back, uh, I think this is the outline of the talk that this was. Um, and it accidentally uh, leaked out and um, we got an invitation to present. We're very, very happy we did because it gave us an opportunity to develop the material into a talk. And I'm very happy as to, uh, point out as well, this is actually the first time that Dave and I have given a talk together. That's right. That's right. Okay. Um, so as an overview, uh, we're going to go through a bunch of things here. First, we're going to explain the need for rebooting. Uh, and then we'll go through the pros and cons of the internet. And I know that everybody knows the pros and loves the pros of the internet. There are cons. And there are quite a few. Um, so we'll go through those as well. Then we're going to throw some stones and see if we can break some windows. The only way you can figure out how to redesign something is to know what's broken. So we're going to see if we can break things. OK. Um, and then we're going to give you an example of a different way of looking at networking uh, that I happen to have developed uh, when I was at USC, which is uh, 
originally a way of looking at layering, it turned into a new way of teaching computer networks. Uh, but it will give you that sense of things are a little bit different now. And maybe if we look at things differently, we get a different answer. Then we will discuss the challenge of transition. Anytime you want to go from the old to the new, you can't just turn it off and jump. That makes things hard. Uh, and then we'll uh, tr have some concluding remarks. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning, there are websites on the first page. They're reiterated on the last page. There's also a bunch of resources on the last page that you can click to as well uh, on our pages as well to, to link to. Okay, so by way of introduction and background, uh, this all started with the idea of uh, systems design. Uh, the, the adage says, build one and throw it away because the first time you do it, it's going to be wrong. And it's not whether it's going to be wrong, it's when it's going to be wrong. And one of the first people to put this down in writing uh, was Brooks. Uh, Fred Brooks wrote this, this wonderful book called The Mythical Man Month. If you haven't read it, you should. It's not very long. Um, and it's got a lot of really interesting points in it. And one of them is here. It's build one, throw it away. Because your first system is always going to have certain kinds of mistakes and there's no way around. But he's pointing at a much deeper point about systems architecture, and we're going to discuss that. There's different kinds of ways of rebooting things. You can do an in-place incremental modification. Uh, you can update, you can extend, and we've been doing that with the internet for nearly 40, 40 some years or so. Uh, you can also, at some point, hit control alt delete as they say in Windows parlance, uh, and just replace everything. Uh, it turns out that did happen with the internet back in 1983. Uh, the first version of the internet was a protocol called the Network Control Protocol, NCP, and there was a redesign, a significant redesign in the architecture and the protocols that happened that gave us TCP IP. And there was a day, day before that you ran NCP, day after that you ran TCP. And that, that has a, a very dramatic effect uh, it allows you to not have to carry a lot of baggage with you about the old way of doing things, but it also means it's a very abrupt change. Many of you may have heard about the clean slate projects and the clean slate approaches. So this is the idea that instead of being stuck with what you were started with, you erase the board and, you know, this is back when people had chalkboards, and you uh, erase the slate and you come up with a new way of approaching things. I think that clean slate is wonderful. Uh, when the clean slate project happens back in around 2000 or so, I reminded everybody that it's at least how most people like me would start Monday by erasing the board. So, uh, but then I put an idea on it. I think it's not about the clean, it's about the idea that you put on the clean slate. Okay, what is architecture? We're gonna talk about systems architecture and network architecture. Architecture is not this very vague concept. It is, it does have a definition. It's the description of a system and how it behaves through listing its components, the component behaviors and properties, the way the components interact, and the way they behave as a whole. And by describing a system that way, you're saying what you want the system to do and how to break it into manageable chunks that interact with each other. That is architecture. And there's different ways of looking at architecture, but they're all kinds, they're all variants of the same thing. This is how we built the Eiffel Tower, picture in the background there. Um, that's also how we built uh, the internet to some extent, as we had an architecture. When you are building a so large system, there are a lot of intertwined components. There's networking, there's processing, there's operating systems. And anytime you do any one of those things or any of those together, you have this opportunity to design the pieces that you're putting together at the same time, the hardware and the software, the inboard processing and the outboard processing, the library, the applications, okay? You can co-design the pieces as you go and take advantage of the best parts of each, right? If it's hard to do in hardware, maybe it's easy to do in software. It's easy to do in software, hard to do in, you know, back and forth. Or you can let everybody do their own thing and then retrofit and correct it. And that turns out to be really, really, really hard. Um, so getting these pieces right, getting the interactions between them right, and sometimes having that balance of knowing what to, to put into what bin 
is an integral part of what architecture is. You are, the phrase is right sizing. You're picking the right size of the chunks of your system. Okay. You always have to reboot things. There is no getting around it. There's very few things in, wor in the world or in life that you get once of and it never changes and it's always fine. And there's two reasons. The first thing is sometimes you couldn't get what you want as the Stones used to say. Um, and sometimes you get what you need uh, and your needs have changed. So it's either that what you, uh, you didn't know, you, you knew what you wanted, but you couldn't get it like a flying car. I want a flying car. I don't have a flying car. Um, someday, maybe I will have a flying car. We'll have to redesign cars to fly, okay? Um, but also, uh, I started off wanting a flying car because I wanted to get from one place to the next fast so that I can get to my meetings. Well, here we are on the internet having a meeting, didn't need a flying car to get there, but what I need is bandwidth. So my needs have changed, right? Now, if you've ever watched the old uh, TV show specials with uh, Charlie Brown and Lucy, uh, Charlie Brown always ran up to kick the football, and Lucy always pulled the football away and changed the game, okay? And that happens to us all the time when we're building a system. The goals change. In the beginning of the internet, uh, it was about designing a system for inter interpersonal communication, doing what we're doing right now, email, messaging, video, right? And also remote work, like remote login that we take for granted it was hard back then, and that was what it was for. It wasn't designed to survive a nuclear attack. That's a legend, but it's not actually a direct uh, origin story of what was going on here. And the internet, may have wished it could handle voice and video, but in the beginning, nobody was thinking of that. Uh, as Dave mentioned, the bandwidths were way too small and just wasn't a consideration. And it was not designed to scale. It has scaled wonderfully. It was, nobody sat down and said, what happens when two, bi two billion people are on the internet? Okay. You think about telephones. Telephones are just one step in an evolution of telecommunication. The first telecommunication was actually text messaging. It was the telegraph, okay? Um, and then we changed our mind and said, no, we don't want just text. We want to talk to the person on the other end. Then we wanted to email them. Now we want to video them. And some of you are more comfortable emailing and texting than you are picking up a phone. And that's fine, but that's saying that the goals change. You also get outdated questions. Um, Back in the Stone Ages, when I started in this field, in the mid-1980s, there was a lot of money being spent trying to figure out how to do video over a voice line, over a 56K line. Uh, and there was a couple of reasons for that. One is everybody wanted to do teleconferencing, and that was all you could get. And the other is that deaf people wanted to do sign language. And if you were doing sign language, you could at least see the signs if you had video. And there was a lot of work trying to figure out how do you do sign language over a phone line? How do you compress voice under eight kilohertz? How do you get under seven bits of sample? We don't ask those questions anymore. We don't ask them because we don't have to, okay? So we have to change things. Now, Dave, my advisor, has had a principle for many, many years uh, that I'll call Farber's principle, uh, which is that resources change. I think the adage that you have, Dave, is that Every 20 years, you can go back and pick an old systems paper, pick it up, and look at it. And whatever assumptions they're making, ask yourself, are they still true? Now, think about 20 years ago. Did you have a disk that was bigger than you could ever want? Did you have bandwidth that was bigger than you could ever want? Did you have a screen with more resolution than you could ever want? Did you have a, a system that did all that that you could fit in your pocket? No. So. The resources changing changes what becomes feasible. Again, when we started in this field, when I started in this field, one of the first things I bought for myself was a hard drive because we didn't have them, we had floppies. The first hard drive I bought had five megabytes of information. And I only ever thought of what I could do with five meg of information. I would never get where I was, where I am today, okay? Five meg, is one song, one. You only get to listen to one song on your iPod forever, okay? That's all it is. So by thinking ahead, by looking at how things scale, 
uh, we get different answers to different questions. There are things we don't do anymore. We used to pay money for software that would compress RAM, that would compress data on the disk, that would cache things on the disk. We don't do that anymore. It's too cheap. Um, you, what you call a GPU, we used to call a supercomputer and it took up a room. It's largely the same thing. It was a SIMD special purpose computer. Okay. And there, were a, there was a time when, when you put something in memory, you didn't know if it was going to be there or change very much. Uh, and so you had to have a lot of checksums on it. We don't have those anymore. Largely the checksums and error codes that we have in our protocols are there to check software bugs, not hardware failures. Now, there's another story that's useful to understand here. Einstein was a professor at Princeton University who was teaching a class. And he gave a final exam. And he passed the exam out to the students. And one of the students went up to him and said, Dr. Einstein, I don't understand. What are you doing here? He said, what do you mean? He says, you've given me the same questions you gave the students last year. How's that helpful? You know, you, 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 I know what the, I, I knew the questions from last year. I knew the answers from last year. How, you're, you're repeating the questions. And Einstein said, that's okay. The questions are the same, but the answers are changing. Okay. And so again, when we ask a question, can I do something? How much bandwidth does this take? Is bandwidth even something I want to minimize? The answers change. So even if the questions don't change and the answers do, we get a different answer, a different system. Okay. The big thing about systems architecture is when you design it, you don't know what you're doing. Nobody does. It's very rare that you start a system off with a set of specific requirements that will make a customer or a user happy forever, and you build to that. You design to what you know at the time you start building, but that rarely is what you needed to know when you started. Um, now, years later, uh, you look at the system and realize, gee, if I only knew then what I know now, hindsight, uh, I could have designed the system better. I understand the system. I understand the relationship of parts better. So that's another argument for redesigning the system. Okay, so these are all reasons why we want, re want to redesign a system. Okay, even Brooks, who had this wonderful idea of build one and throw it out, he rewrote things himself. It turns out uh, he had second thoughts. Uh, all of the lessons that he learned on, that he wrote into the Mythical Man Month were from his experience on a project called OS360, okay? Well, it turns out that before OS360, there was a project called Stretch. It's a really interesting program that had memory interleaving, multi-programming. It, it literally bit off a lot and tried to do a lot of things really fascinating system if you get a chance to read the book on it. And again, he built Stretch, build another one. Build OS 360, build another one. So don't, you don't get out of this wanting to redesign things. He even did it to his own book. The first time he wrote the book, he said, build one and throw it out. Then he said, this is wrong. In the update to his edition that was written 25 years later in 1995, he said, this is too radical and it's too simplistic. Um, it's not just build a second one, it's constantly redesigning something. He also cautioned us against what is called the second system effect. So the first time you build something, you have very high hopes, and very big aspirations. You try to put a lot of stuff in there, uh, but then you actually build it and not everything gets in, but you make a list a list of everything you wish you had done right, everything that you left out. When you build a second system, you're a little too eager, it turns out, to want to put all that back in. And so the second system often ends up being worse than the first. Uh, and maybe the third is the one that is the one that you're going to like. It depends. So this is the, the thing to consider about this idea of rebooting and redesigning, re-architecting. Okay. Here's some good examples, if you're not familiar with it, of reboots besides the internet itself, which I'll talk about at the end. Green Day, if you've heard of that band, had an album that they recorded. They spent a long time in the studio and at home writing this album, recording the album. They had the tapes, the masters. In 2005, 
the masters for that album, which was called Cigarettes and Valentines, was stolen. Rather than try to remember those songs and recover them, they started from scratch. Now, the album that they wrote from scratch after that was called American Idiot. And it was a commercial success. It was uh, a success in terms of awards. Um, it was way, way uh, one of their biggest hits in terms of an album. And yet they found the masters to Cigarettes and Valentines and people listened to it and said, no, it was not as good. It was a good thing you started over. There's a, a, a example from engineering. There's this um, bridge called the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which is the picture in your screen. Um, and it was built a little bit wrong and winds came through the uh, channel where it was built and started to make it oscillate. And it's shown in the uh, mechanical engineering classes as an example of this uncontrolled oscillation that keeps building up. And the entire bridge ends up uh, galloping like a horse. It just buckles back and forth and back and forth and eventually breaks. They had to build a second one. Uh, David brought up in his talk, the Shinkansen. Uh, when we wanted faster trains, uh, everybody wanted faster trains. America wanted faster trains, Japan wanted faster trains. When America wanted a faster train, we built the Excella and we put it on the old tracks. It turns out that was a bad idea. Excella doesn't go very fast. It is limited by the rails that it's on. When Japan built the Shinkansen, they put down new rails. That made all the difference, okay? Um, we've had many examples of operating systems that were completely redesigned, not backward compatible. Uh, some of the DOS Windows evolution, uh, Apple went from using a 68K processor uh, to using, it turns out in the middle there, um, another processor, and then using the x86 and the uh, x87 processors. The internet itself had a couple of transitions to go from old protocols to new, which were disruptive, or to do these incremental changes, which were not disruptive, or to do things that I'll call partly disruptive, which is the transition to IPv6. So let's look at that, the internet and the pros and cons of it. People uh, all love the internet, people all use the internet, but not everybody understands that the internet is really, really, really simple. At the end of the day, it's these three rules and that's it. It's packets, which are variable length messages that are self-addressed. It's addresses that are global, not local, with a little bit of structure in them. And it's local forwarding decisions. So you do not have to look at everything in the world to figure out where a packet goes. All you have to do is look at your inputs, look at your outputs, look at the packet and go. Those three things make the internet what it is. The good news is it had some successes. The first thing it did was unify. And that was one of the things it was supposed to do, it was supposed to take a bunch of different networks and connect them together. And it succeeded, it largely succeeded at being the unifying layer. You don't have to worry about what protocol somebody else speaks. If they speak the internet, you speak the internet, everybody, everything works, you go home, okay? Another thing that the internet does, best efforts, good enough. We don't worry about a drop packet. Uh, we don't throw a hissy fit when it happens. We don't scream, uh, it's okay. And what that says is that it is more important to connect to everybody a little than it is to connect to anybody really, really, really good. That's the ubiquity over performance. Okay. And then, like I said before, this local decisions for global behavior turns out to be very important and very powerful because what it does is it means that I can add a network to the internet without having to coordinate with 2 billion other users. Okay. And that's what helps people want to join and join easily. There are, however, opportunities to improve. The internet made a couple of mistakes. David pointed out in his presentation that in email, we have a from address, but we don't actually have an official part of the email protocol that tells you the origin. So you know how to reach, to return a message to who you think sent the packet, but you don't have information on where the packet actually came from. And that's part of why we have the problem with spam that we have today. <clears throat> it turns out that TCP has a particular thing. It does a handshake and it keeps a certain amount of state at the endpoints. When the connection is over, 
it leaves state at one of the endpoints to make sure that it won't reuse packets inappropriately. It turns out that the party that ends up holding that state is the party that closes the connection, not the party that opens it. Well, what does that mean? And why is that important? Well, I might run a web server to a million people and a million individuals each open one connection. Then they close it. Now I am stuck holding the bag on a million connections. If we had designed things the other way around, everybody would just hold one, which would be a lot easier and a lot more scalable. Okay. Um, there's this idea of the fields in a packet. Are they fixed length? Are they extensible? Extensible fields are something called TLVs, type length value. So it says, I am a source directed a message. A source directed message has a length of 14 bytes and the value of the 14 bytes is such and such, that's TLV. They have pros and cons. It's packets, uh, headers are easier to parse, much faster in hardware. TLVs are, less, are much more extensible. We also, when we started the internet, we gave out chunks of addresses, um, but we didn't worry about how many addresses people were going to use. And all of a sudden we ended up giving out uh, 16 million addresses or so to MIT. Now, does MIT have 16 million users or 16 million computers? No. Did they need that many addresses? No, but they got that many. And now that we gave them that, it's hard to get them back. That's part of how we ran out of addresses. Okay. And finally, the endian choice. There's this thing called endian, little endian, big endian. When you have a four byte or an eight byte structure, a multi byte structure, you send it low byte first or high byte first. The internet says high byte first, and almost all of our hardware says low byte first. And so because two different groups made two different decisions, we end up translating things all over the place. And it costs us about 20 or 30% performance, believe it or not. Big things we got wrong. Seven layer model. The internet is not made of seven layers. It's not made of Swiss cheese, okay? Um, that was a model that was uh, proposed. It was used to explain things, never really mapped to reality very well and was implemented only as a prototype and never actually ran uh, outside of test environments. Um, the local subnetting issue, um, security boundaries uh, versus the way Multics does things. As Dave mentioned, security is a thing that the internet didn't get quite right. Um, and also in some sense, the internet has been um, largely influenced by people who think it, security is binary. You're either secure or you're insecure. And if I told you uh, that you, uh, you know, let's say you ride your bicycle to campus, okay? And I said, you're, you know, everything has to have a lock on it, okay? And your car has a lock and the car lock is a hundred pounds. You'd say, well, that's fine, it's a car, no problem. Okay, and your bike lock is a hundred pounds and you have to use it if you want it to be secure. What would you do? You'd leave the lock at home. And a lot of internet security is like that. It is so expensive in terms of power and CPU processing that people don't turn it on. And that's a problem. And the problem is that we gave them no choices. Okay. So what does a good architecture look like? If we're designing things from scratch, we wanna have a good idea of what we wanna do. It turns out that there are some principles we can use here. Good architecture is like a good list. And to me, a good list is defined as something that is a list of ideas or concepts or components where you have nothing that you wanna add, nothing to get rid of, all the pieces are about the same size and scope and nothing overlaps. If you do that, you've got a good handle on the architecture. But an architecture should also map to things. It provides an analogy to what's going on. We call that a conceptual homomorphism. It should predict existing behavior. It should predict new behavior. It should give you insight to how the system works, okay? You should say, well, based on this architecture, I would expect the following. And then you can test it. And that, again, is another property of a good architecture. <clears throat> another thing about good design, and Dave brought this up in his previous talk uh, extensively, is it's about balance. Um, there were uh, a number of companies, Intel and Microsoft together in particular, who were all at the table trying to get hardware security to work 
Um, this led largely to things like the trusted platform module. Um, but the problem was everybody wanted security, everybody wanted hardware protection, and nobody thought anybody would pay even two or three dollars for it. Uh, and that was back before uh, we started having supply chain risk problems. We started having uh, these um, uh, attacks on our systems, um, the, the ransomware, uh, things like that. Now, I think if you ask somebody, would you pay two extra dollars for something that was immune to ransomware, I think they'd pay it. But at the time, that was not true. Okay. Multics, hardware, software designed together. Good balance between the two. But again, shows the challenge of doing this integrated design. It took a longer time to build because it was integrated and because it was late uh, on its schedule, it was largely replaced by Unix. Um, so you gotta be careful. Uh, the perfect is the enemy of good enough here. Um, and microcode is another example of this, another example of that hardware software trade. Um, it's programmable, but almost nobody can debug it because once it's in a system, it's hard to change, it's usually burnt in. Uh, people don't understand it. There's no uniform way of debugging it or analyzing it or changing it. Um, I can list on three fingers the number of systems I have seen in my life that had microcode that could change. One of them was, I believe, not Silicon Graphics. There was, a, there was an AI computer that you could um, reload and on a Tuesday it would do one thing and on a Wednesday it would do another thing, but that's just not very common. Okay. So, what if? Now we're gonna now we're gonna throw some rocks and we're gonna see what we can break because you know breaking things is fun. So we want to ask that question: What happens? How can we break things? The reason we're asking "what if" is because we want to do three things. We want to challenge our assumptions. We may not even know what assumptions we have made when we started designing the system, and now we live with them every day. Okay. Uh, those assumptions become constraints and they limit how you design the system and how you use the system. We're going to challenge that context that David mentioned, the assumptions about uh, what environment you're running it in, what resources you have. Um, we also want to challenge the expectations about what the system can do. If we only ever give somebody one thing, they will be content. Uh, Steve Jobs once said that um, the customer doesn't know what they want until I show it to them. And this is another example of that to challenge expectations. So let's consider some assumptions. In the internet, most stub networks, that network at the edge of a network, uh, are broadcast. Uh, most of them are actually ethernet in particular. That influences how our protocols work. Almost all of our protocols have built into them at some level, the notion of broadcast. Broadcast is very, very, very expensive, except in ethernet at the edge, okay? And we have it because it was there when we started designing networks. We assumed it as we went forward and we didn't even know we made the assumption. And now we're stuck with it in some sense, okay? Another example, when you connect to somebody, when you exchange packets with somebody, even if you don't connect, you send large streams of packets, many, many packets, one after the other, many, many round trip times. And so you assume that maybe you don't think, do things right the first round trip, but you get it right after about 10 or 20. And that's okay. I don't have to be great the first time through the system as long as I can correct. Okay. We also assume that packets are pretty small and that allows us to share bandwidth on low speed links. In fact, ATM's cell size of 53 bytes is only 53 because of wanting to share a voice link. We don't need to share voice links per se anymore. We don't do it on a 64 kilobit per second channel. I don't use those very much at all anymore. And so here we have a network architecture, ATM, uh, asynchronous transfer mode, by the way, not the place where you get money, uh, that is making an assumption about packet size based on a, 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 a channel speed that didn't exist effectively at the time it was designed in the late 80s. How do you build a network that's designed to handle 10 gigabit channels when you're really thinking about 64 kilobit channels? The answer is you don't. 
So here's the first rock. Everybody step back, I'm gonna throw it, okay? The first rock is what happens if there's no subnets? Currently, the way we figure out how to get across a network, uh, the way we do ARP, the way we do uh, neighbor discovery, the way we do duplicate address detection, endpoint configuration, multicast, is all based on the ability to send one packet and have it go many places at once. So what if all links were actually unicast? Well, we, we hit this problem a long time ago. There's an RFC on it called RFC 1577 uh, that introduces a concept called LANE, LAN emulation. And what it does is it says, instead of broadcasting, I will always send my request to one place in the network. Okay, so now we have, instead of broadcast, we have a fan in problem that's not scalable. But that's okay. If you didn't realize it, broadcast isn't scalable either. Um, so would we want to keep that? Would we want to change that? This is the question that it makes us ask. Now, let's look at what happened when we go faster. Turns out, everybody thinks when you get a faster internet connection, the packets go faster. It's actually not true at all. The packet head always takes the same amount of time through the link, depending upon what link it is, whether it's a wire or whether it's a fiber or something else. But if it's a fiber that goes one megabit per second or a fiber that goes a terabit, that first bit is going exactly the same speed through it. Okay, what happens to packets is they shrink. They get shorter in time and longer in bandwidth. So you see in the diagram there, how a long packet that takes up a long piece of time to send that, or a long message that takes a lot of packets, takes a long piece of time. When I send it over a faster link, the head of the packet gets there exactly the same time, but the tail gets there faster. So we say that the transfer happens quicker. So if I look at the bottom of the slide there, you'll see that I have a handshake, then I have this long transmission of data, and then another handshake. That's what happens over a slow link. The faster the link is, the, the less time I spend sending that data because it's high bandwidth, the more time those handshakes matter. Over the fastest links that you can get, I still have to do that handshake, but I spend almost no time sending the data, okay? So given that, let's look at things and ask a question. Again, ready to throw the rock. What happens if my flows, instead of being hundreds, thousands, millions of packets, and tens, dozens, hundreds of round trip times, I only send one packet? This will break almost everything in the internet because that is, that is designed to deal with flow control or congestion control, because all of it is based on the idea that I mess up in the short term, but it all evens out over the steady state. Well, if I only send one packet, there is no steady state, okay? And so if that's true, and I send one packet every single time and I do that only, I get in trouble really, really fast. All of my congestion flow control on the internet will not work. All of my queuing mechanisms and feedback mechanisms will not work, okay? We would have to redesign the internet. This is a good reason, okay? Now let's look at that packet. The MTU, the largest packet that we can send in the network has not changed since we started designing networks. It was 1500 bytes when we started or 500 bytes when we started. It went up to 1500 bytes pretty quick. It's now about 1200 bytes, but it really hasn't gotten big. It might be appropriate instead of thinking how big the packet is to ask how big it should be. If I said, if everybody has a hundred times the bandwidth they used to have, can't I just send a packet that's a hundred times bigger and wouldn't that be more efficient? Maybe packets should be a microsecond. Whatever that is on your link, it's what it is. As the bandwidth gets higher, maybe the packets get bigger. Maybe they're just large. Maybe the packet is larger than the entire round trip bandwidth delay product of your system. Okay. What if the packet was so big you couldn't store and forward it? What would you have to do different? Okay. Again, we're throwing rocks. Consider our context here. When we started off the internet, we had limited CPU. 
That's why the original processors, the imps, were outboard. They were separate devices because you didn't want the CPU of your system, which was busy doing you know, text on a screen or vectors on a diagram, to be bombarded with the idea of building packets. So you had to push that out to this outboard processor. We had limited memory and disk till about 20 years ago. And we had software to deal with that. Compression, on-demand access, things like that. Until about 10 years ago, we had limited bandwidth, okay? So we had compression and synchronous exchanges to deal with that. Before IPv6, we had limited addresses, so we had to use NATs. And we were error prone throughout, so we had to do all this error detection and correction. So consider that context. And this is the question, and Dave will love this because this goes way back. This was the question of my thesis. What if bandwidth, instead of being a constraint, was a resource? And I asked that question in 1992, and I got the looks you can imagine at that time, are you crazy? Okay, at the time, 2,400 bits per second modems or 4,800 40 k bit per second modems were all the rage. Nobody had a meg, nobody had 10, nobody had 100. Nobody could spell the word gigabit, much less pronounce it. We all know that, right? Um, bandwidth limits the usage. And so uh, we are still, in fact, bandwidth limited. Um, my house is not particularly bandwidth rich, and I have 100 megabit per second. But when I do speed tests, I usually don't get close to that. And when I try to download something from a real site, I never get that. Okay. But what happens if bandwidth were free? And that was my thesis question. And the answer is, instead of prefetching, you push. And so you touch Google, and while you're sitting there watching the TV or looking at something else, uh, Google should be sending everything it can, every link on every page, every page that points to, every page that points to, et cetera. What would that do for you? Well, we looked at it. And in 1996, we asked the question, how much bandwidth could you actually use? And at the time, we were happy with things like ISDN, 64 kilobit per second links, or maybe what was called a T1 line, a 1.5 megabit link. And we have a budget of 100 milliseconds of latency that human beings are comfortable thinking about and comfortable with that delay. So in 100 milliseconds, what could you send? And you see the curves here. Well, it turns out that at the time, you could do web browsing pretty effectively, not frustrate people. But if you started putting too many icons on your page or using a high-res screen, everything ground to a halt and people were very unhappy. They said, hey, the network is slow. I need a better network. And we said, okay, what network do you need? So here's the question you might ask yourself, how much bandwidth do you actually need at your house? And I will propose that the bandwidth that you need is defined by the bits on your screen, okay? At the time in 1996, this is again 24 years ago, I said that if you had 300 dots per inch, you'd probably want somewhere between 100 and 500 megabits per second to be happy with the click speed and the response time of your network. Well, guess what? That's a retina display, 300 bits per inch, okay? Or 300 dots per inch. And that's the home bandwidth that we've kind of topped out at right now. And yes, internet companies will try and tell you, you need a gigabit. You should pay them another $100 a month. But I'm here to tell you, you don't. You don't need that until you start having higher resolution screens. 500 dots per inch, 1,000 dots per inch. They're coming. We haven't seen them yet, but they're going to come. And that's when it's going to matter. Okay. But you can look at this and you can look ahead. 24 years ago, you could look ahead. Okay, another question. Right now, most of our endpoints have one IP address. What if that wasn't true? Well, if the address to host ratio was greater than one, we have multi-homing and OS server parallelism, and that's the VMs and things like that that we do now, where we start having more addresses per host. We could also have less. The idea of a NAT is not just because the internet guys want to charge you more money 
for our network connection so that you can run servers. Um, it actually has other reasons for existing and maybe that's a good thing. So what if the address to host ratio is less than one? What if you didn't start off assuming that all endpoints had IP addresses? What would change? How would you identify your endpoints? Right now we do it with a bit of a, a hack, frankly. How would we do this if we wanted to make it broader? Okay. Names, we have names on the internet. We have DNS names, we have IP addresses. If you look in the bottom corner of your screen, you'll see a, a email address and a phone number. Those names have a property that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. They're ephemeral. They go poofed. They disappear. They are the uh, email and phone equivalent of, uh, these, uh, of Snapchat, okay? So I'm sending these messages and they're gonna disappear at the time the talk is over. So we, you know, we don't continually have questions every time everybody looks at the talk because I'm not gonna you know, answer the questions that are not online. When you are thinking about addresses, you think maybe that the addresses should have a time, time that they're valid, okay? We had a link that we used for this talk. We emailed that link around. It would be nice if encoded in the link was the information that said, when the link was active, okay? What if they had other properties? What if they had a virtual ID, like a VPN ID or a security ID, okay? Well, it turns out getting to security, security is very expensive. It's very high bandwidth cost, slows things down by a factor somewhere between two and four. It adds delays because you're storing forward uh, uh, algorithms, you block things together in order to do encryption. It also has a very high processing load, which you know on your cell phone means you burn your battery down and your laptop means you need a bigger processor or more cooling or can't run those Bitcoin algorithms. Um, and it requires key infrastructure. So let's look at all those things. So what if security were cheaper? Instead of all or nothing, we could do something that was faster or quicker or lighter, or in fact, anonymous. Turns out those are useful. Uh, we had looked into a variety of these things and said, what if you do Diffie-Hellman, but you don't worry about having an X509 key? You get some security. You just don't know who you're getting security to. And it turns out that's still useful in some cases. And we created an IETF working group called Buttons to do that, better than nothing security. Um, you can do layered checks on your packets, which gives you a weak check so that you don't spend all your CPU time throwing out something you're probably going to throw out anyway. Okay. Uh, you can do parallelism and chaining. That is, again, a little bit weaker, but higher performance. You can also do things over smaller units than a packet. And again, drive that storing forward latency down. So there's a lot of opportunities here. Now, want to be careful. Uh, there are a lot of... Uh, toys that people have built, if you will, or ideas that people have explored in the internet. Uh, the Clean Slate Architecture Program, Active Net, Software Defined Networking, Information Set or Networking, Delay Tolerant Networking. Those are examples. They could be good in their environment for a particular thing, but let me caution you, uh, and not necessarily to point those out as being examples of this, but here's the thing. Just because you say take something and change it to the opposite, being a contrarian, doesn't mean you have an answer. It may mean you have a direction, a new idea of something to do, but uh, Maslow is a philosopher who said, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. And it's very true. And so if you switch something up before you figure out what you're gonna do with it and say, I found the answer. If only I turn my car upside down, I won't wear out the tires great, okay? You're going to wear out the roof, okay? And it's not going to roll very well. And so you have to be careful of just saying, I'm going to flip the things upside down and change the script and come up with an answer. Okay. Other benefits of asking what if, for those of you in the audience. Buried in this talk and these questions and other questions are very interesting projects, very interesting papers, a ton of PhD theses, or a sabbatical if you've already got a PhD. <clears throat> so feel free, dig in. There's a lot of ideas here, uh, but the point here is to get you to ask your own questions, to get your own rocks and throw them at things and see what you can break, okay?
I did this and I looked at networking uh, and asked the question of what if, okay? So here's an example. I looked at the network and said, the internet architecture that we had and said, well, we have a problem. We have this seven layer architecture that everybody seems to know and love, but it breaks all over the place. Um, what is IPsec? Oh, that's layer 3.2 or 3.5. What's IPsec or what's MPLS? That's layer 2.5. If you have to put a decimal, you don't have layers anymore, right? <laughs> okay. Um, where do these protocols fit in? Where does ARP? Nobody can tell you where ARP is. It's not part of the model. We have layers on top of layers. If IP is layer three, because Ethernet is layer two and TCP is layer four, then what is IP over IP? Are they both layer three? That breaks that model again. What is IP over UDP? I've got three over four over three. Okay. And I've got these things that we call the control plane and the management plane and the naming plane. And everybody says, oh, we have this beautiful seven layer stack. And then we have this thing on the side that doesn't fit in. And I looked at that and said, okay, that's busted. What can we do that's different than that? So I looked about again, back at the architecture and said that seven layer model never was, okay. That a lot of what the way we were doing protocols was very ad hoc. And a lot of what we built as internet architecture was very art or collage. It was, oh, we do one here. Oh, we need this, let's do that. We need this, let's do that. But nobody was stepping back and saying, what does the whole landscape look like? Do these pieces make sense? Where is the science? We, we, we're computer scientists, right? Where's the science? Where's the foundation? If you took a science class, let's say you took uh, physics, you would start off with Newton's three laws of motion. If you took a biology class, you'd start off with uh, taxonomies of, of the biological systems, okay? If you take chemistry, you start off with a bunch of principles. There are our fundamental principles. We don't have them. We tend to think of networking and internet architecture as, oh, uh, well, let me tell you how people built it. If we think that we need a reboot, maybe part of the reason we need to reboot is we didn't have that grand vision of the foundation. So here's a good example of what I think is that foundation. Um, I started an idea called the First Principles Approach to Computer Networking and taught it, it developed the class, 1800 slides, taught it at USC for a couple of years, gave it to a bunch of other professors at USC, UCLA, and a couple other places who are also teaching it. Uh, and I'm currently working on this as a textbook. Um, the idea is that you start with something that can't be argued with, information theory, two-party shared state. Then you extend it to multi-party, multi-hop, multiple scales, and you leverage the only tools that I think we have in CS. And when I look at CS, I think of all the tools we have that are unique to CS. We have math, we have group theory, but that's math, right? We have language theory, but that's, that's also kind of math. The things that we have that nobody else has are abstraction and recursion, okay? Um, and so if you build a model out of this, you can get an integrated system that actually explains layering, forwarding, and name resolution and everything at once. So our three laws of motion are, in my view, Shannon's communication theory. It says shared state between, it tells you how to do shared state between two given parties that are directly connected by a perfect channel. That's your starting point. Start with that and then relax all of the phrases that are underlined and see what you can get. How do you figure out which party you're talking to? How do you do indirect connections and how do you deal with errors? And by dealing with those two or three things, you build an architecture. You have a logical progression from communication theory, multi-party, layering, to naming, to recursion, and you build everything. Here's the example. You start with a perfect channel, you add errors, then you show how you make a channel real. Like you, a channel is this philosophical, mathematical concept, and it turns out that if you build it, you have to throw things at people. In physics, there are only two things you can throw at somebody. It turns out fermions and bosons, and they have properties. And interestingly enough, if you think of the properties of fermions and bosons from physics, it tells you a lot about how we design link protocols. So again, this all comes from first principles. 
And then we build finite state machines to deal with the endpoints, okay? Multi-party to relay. How do we do the transition from assuming that everybody's directly connected to they're not? How do we do shared channels, which is back to that fermion and boson example? How do we do implicit shared channels with token passing and token ring? And then how do we do relaying to emulate that? Okay. Layering turns out to be not a seven answer problem, but this recursive concept of abstraction. We abstract a layer so that we can deal with both heterogeneity and scale. There are two ways we can layer, by translation, converting between things, and by encapsulation, which is sort of stacking things as we do now. And it turns out that you want to combine the two. You encapsulate the data, you translate the headers, okay? Naming is not this separate thing outside of a network. It's an integral part to what happens of a in a network. And so it has to be built into that layering mechanism, that translation mechanism, as though the ways that we do it, the resolution mechanisms, the idea of the operating systems names versus the names inside the network and how we set names up automatically. Okay. And finally, recursion. Now on the screen is what looks like a very complicated diagram of different protocols with different name translation tables between them. And you know many of these tables. There's like an ARP table in there. There's your socket table. There's your DNS table. That's where those tables are, okay? Uh, the tables are in blue. Uh, the orange part are the things we call protocols. We don't have a protocol stack. We have a directed acyclic graph, it turns out, that starts at the application at the top and ends up at the interfaces at the bottom, which are protocol. Now, if you look at this algorithm, uh, this data structure, and you traverse it using a recursive piece of software, you get everything that we do in networking, it turns out. The path that you take through that is pushed onto the front of your packets. It turns out that we do have a stack. It's not the stack of protocols, it's the stack of headers. We push and pop off of the, off of the packet to keep track of where we are in that state machine, okay? But the state machine is more complicated. This state machine, can shift from TCP to a wired circuit without affecting the application, okay? This machine can translate between TCP and UDP without affecting the application in ways that the existing stacks can't, okay? And it turns out, let me back up a second there, that going down that path and also going between nodes in a network is the same mechanism, okay? One is recursion, and the other, if you know recursion, is tail recursion, is how you go across. So it turns out that with one mechanism, we can integrate naming, which is the blue boxes, with the protocols, the orange boxes, with the way we traverse them, with the way we encode them into the headers, with the way we build the endpoint up and down, with the way we go across the network. All one thing, okay? And it turns out that a lot of the stuff that we study otherwise in networking is optimization. Dealing with errors of deficiencies like corruption and loss and tampering and authentication and privacy. The red part up there is what we call security, but they're just deficiencies. Dealing with performance and dealing with emulation, okay? Um, it turns out that if you do things this way, again, I threw a rock, I broke the internet. Now I'm saying how to fix it. I come up with an architecture that actually the internet and the OSI models are degenerate cases of. That's what a model should do. It should give you the existing stuff, right? It should explain existing stuff, but it extends to explain places where the existing stuff doesn't work. I no longer have a problem understanding what IP over IP is or IP over UDP over IP is, okay? They're just passed through that bag. Okay, I don't have a problem thinking about those control plane, management plane, naming plane. They're all part of the same thing. Okay, but and again, I predict something the internet can't do. And I would have not have thought of this until I looked back at my model and said, what can my model do that the internet can't? And it's changed the transport protocol on the fly to the application without any effect. That's that late binding. Okay, and the key to this is that I was trying to figure out 
why does the internet do what it does, not what does it do now? I think if you want to understand something, you need to ask why. Okay. So I've given you some reasons to reboot. I've given you some examples of the internet's pros and cons and reasons that you want to reboot it. Uh, and I give you an example of how I thought of rebooting the internet for at least for teaching purposes as an architecture. That may not be the only part of the internet we want to reboot, but that's one. Okay. Now you want to reboot. How do you reboot? You've got this big chasm that you have to get across, this big gap. How do you get from the old to the new? Well, you can evolve things incrementally. You can go like HTTP 1.1 to 2.1.2 to 2.0. Uh, Multipath TCP is built on TCP. Quick is built on UDP. We have emulation libraries. When Apple uh, shifted to the x86 architecture, uh, they didn't stop the presses. They made things run with emulation libraries. Okay, that's one way to do is to evolve. A completely different way of doing things is to replace. Um, the NCP to TCP IP transition in January of 1983 is a good example. But the important example I want to point out here is we talked about Multics and it's not, it's Multics, not Mutalix. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a phrase in networking or in many things of something called a flag day, which is the day when before the flag day, you had the old one and after the flag day, you have the new one. And the reason we have the phrase flag day is because Multics changed versions of the way it represented text, ASCII text, on June 14th, 1966, which is the day in the United States we celebrate a flag. It's called Flag Day in the United States. So a flag day happened on Flag Day in the United States first. Okay. Um, you can also combine the two approaches of evolving and replacing, uh, as we've done as well. There are competing interests here. Um, Vendors want their stuff to work with everybody else's, but they want you to buy their stuff. So my car is just like everybody else's car when you want to drive it, but my car has special things other cars don't have. So you either want to break into a mar market or corner it. Uh, and by doing that, you often end up pushing things in a different direction. Do you design for today or for tomorrow? Right? Are you trying to sell something cheap or build something that somebody can use in 20 years? Okay. Are you trying to absorb everything that everybody does around you? That's Borg from, from Star Trek. Or are you trying to say, no, 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 you didn't follow the rules that I set down. It turns out that comes from a concept called the Hammurabi Code, which a couple of slides back, I had that, that stone tablet up. That's the Hammurabi Code. Um, that's the difference between Linux and, and BSD. Both of them were successors to Unix. Both of them were free. Both of them were intended to be relatively open. But in both cases, somebody had to control the kernel. Linus Torvalds controlled the Linux kernel, and the BSD consortium controlled the BSD kernel. When new software came out, new drivers, new operating system features, et cetera, Linus said, I'll take it. And he took everything. He had that Borg mentality. Take one of everything. BSD said, if we don't know where it came from and we don't think we can trust it, no, it doesn't go in. Which is exactly why everything works on Linux or mostly everything will work at least once on Linux, but BSD is more stable. And the reason everything runs on Linux is because they never saw a, a driver they didn't like, whether they trusted it or not, whereas BSD will only take trusted stuff, okay? Are you designing for correctness or speed? Coding speed, running speed, whatever. You've got to make that decision. Okay. The innovator's dilemma. There's a book on this as well. If you haven't read, it's a good one. Large companies do not innovate well because they don't want to abandon their big markets. Do not look to Ford to build something that puts cars out of a job. They sell cars. They don't want to stop selling cars. So they're not going to come up with scooters, okay? Um, so it's got to be the little companies who take that risk. Then there's the funders dilemma. And I'll, I'll say this with all due respect, the National Science Foundation and DARPA in the U.S. fund a lot of the research, um, but they have some peculiarities. The NSF often gives money out only one student at a time, and that limits the size and scope of what you can do. Okay. 
Uh, DARPA focuses on results, doesn't really do a lot of research. Um, they want to see it work. They want to see results. They, want, they don't want to say maybe it's going to work. Even though they say that in their, their brochures, they're really focused on results. The industry wants to see products. They don't want to pay for something that you can use in 20 years. Used to be they did invest in that. You can blame Michael Milken for the reason we don't do that anymore. Uh, companies can't afford to invest in long-term research anymore uh, because the companies that don't can outsell the companies that do because they can sell their stuff cheaper because they're not subsidizing research. But then we don't end up with those pearls that we invent because we didn't know we were looking for them and we didn't know what we were going to do with them when we invented them. AT&T came up with a transistor. AT&T came up with Unix. Neither one of those was designed for an immediate product. It was designed to use money that was set aside for long-term research. We don't have that anymore. We're not going to get the next big idea from these companies because they're not putting money in there. And then the United States in particular has this problem with alternative facts. I don't like that phrase. Fact is a fact. Fiction is fiction. Um, this idea that, that everything has two sides or everything has three sides is not always true. Uh, if it is, it's going to limit how you look at things. So you got to be careful. And finally, we look at some of these other things where uh, the, there's cycles in the way we do things. Um, there's times when everybody said, do all your processing in board. There's times when they said, move it out. It's a pendulum. Uh, every time you look at the, the clock, you're going to see a different answer. Okay. Um, some systems have support for errors. Some systems have support for none. There's also ambiguous answers. Um, there's no good answer to extensible versus fixed fuels. They both have their place. You can't say, oh, I'm only going to do one thing and that's it. Okay. The same with complex systems versus reduced instruction systems. You have to, you have to accept that you're just going to go back and forth. However, sometimes we have to break the cycle. Okay. I hear a lot of people talking about uh, worrying about changing certain things and putting whole industries out of a job. Okay. Um, if you have too many Uber drivers, you put taxis out of a job. If you have uh, too many um, uh, streaming services, you're going to put the radio companies, uh, the, the, the record companies out of a job. Well, guess what? Um, when my grandmother uh, came to the United States, she had a refrigerator. And she didn't call it a refrigerator. She called it an ice box because that's what it was. It was a box in which you put ice that kept your food cold. And the ice man would come around every so often and sell you a block of ice to put in your fridge. And then somebody came up with this brilliant idea that we could refrigerate using electricity. Okay. That meant the ice man was out of a job. Did we worry about that? No, we moved on. If you think about how pistons work, and there's a limit to how fast a piston can move a propeller, but not a jet. You cannot break the speed of sound with a piston. You can't break the speed of sound with a propeller because a propeller has to break the speed of sound way before the jet has to break the speed of sound or the, the aircraft. Okay. So some of these times there's changes that just leave you behind in the dust and you have to adapt to. And sometimes there's changes that get forced on you. And either way, you've got to deal with it. These are how you break that cycle. So finally, Sisyphus was right. You're always rolling the rock back up the hill and it's always coming down on you and crushing you. No matter when you design a system, you're always going to have to be redesigning it. So plan to redesign your system, plan to throw rocks at it, plan to reboot, plan to think of this. Don't assume everything that is is the way it is and is, will always be. Start asking those hard questions. Start breaking windows. Okay. And if we know anything about design, we know that disorder rules. You don't have to do anything to a system to have it end up just accreting uh, bad things, mistakes, bugs, uh, additions, uh, too many viewpoints, all sorts of things in it. Uh, and you're going to have to clean it up no matter what you do. Okay. Um, when we're done and we say we want to rebuild the internet, we're going to have to ask, ask somebody to help. Again, who's going to help us? We're going to have to do this ourselves. There was no organization we went to that magically said, 
we will stand behind this and it'll work. DARPA and the NSF did fund the internet evolution for a good 20, 25 years. Uh, they didn't say that when they started. We didn't know they were going to do that. Okay, all we knew was they were going to start the first project. So have some hope for that. The internet society is not going to be the place that this happens. Uh, the IETF tends to patch things, and the IAB is called the Internet Architecture Board, but architecture isn't anything that they do anymore. As I said, the NSF only funds one student at a time. In DARPA, they say they want a revolution, but not evolution, but they spend, in my opinion, a lot more time celebrating anniversaries than they do celebrating inaugurations. And uh, if, if you want somebody to listen right now, I'd say uh, find an advisor, uh, find some place to send a paper, or just put the paper out on, on ARXIV uh, and see what you can get people to, to, to respond to. But start thinking about it and do it. This doesn't happen because somebody says you can do it. This doesn't happen because somebody lets you do it. It happens because you do it. Okay. Um, this talk uh, wasn't prepared in a vacuum. Um, it's based largely on a couple of talks that Dave had given at uh, KO University. They're cited up top here. Uh, and a large body of work that I had accumulated over many years uh, at the bottom. Uh, in the PDF of this file, there are links. If you have problems finding anything, go to the straylpha.com website uh, and also go to the KO website to find Dave's stuff. Um, and uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, if anybody had any questions, I didn't see any pop in. Yeah, and the interesting thing about cable that I heard at least was that uh, one of the problems with the way in which cable internet was deployed in the US was there's sort of a hierarchy of um, distributors um, that went from the, the head end down to the, the last box in your neighborhood. And the assumption at one point was that a single box could handle 100 homes. Um, but they didn't, uh, the, the original installers didn't uh, measure the traffic, which is closer to 20 to one. And so that's why there's this whole issue of people saying that if the cable works great when it comes to your neighborhood until all your neighbors get on cable, right? because they didn't put enough of these boxes in at a low enough level of the hierarchy um, because they hadn't measured the, 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 the upload versus downloads. Um, well, also, again, also, the world changed. Uh, Well, they, but, but the switches do. The switches generally have multicast or broadcast built into them. They either do IGMP snooping or the broadcast sends one to every port. And so you get broadcast for free. It has to, the ethernet protocols depend upon it. Right. right. And that's uh, one, of the, one of the lectures that I had for this, uh, this first principles and networking class explains that at least in my view, um, switches are really just ways to emulate shared media. Well, the other problem practically was that Ethernet, uh, when you look at signal and noise problems that you get in the Ethernet protocols, it doesn't work very well right. uh, if you have a real Ethernet. So in fact, there was an instant migration to switches. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, Metcalf and I used to argue because if you looked at a ring, which I was building, the natural way to make a ring was to build it into a switch and the Ethernet went into a switch and you couldn't tell the difference. That's right. Yeah. Um, They're just ways of sharing the media. Right. They're just sharing can, I, can I add one, one thing to the, uh, to the talk, uh, if I can? Uh, there's, there's some fundamental problems. Uh, Joe has been talking about essentially software. And there are big, big problems with our hardware, which are not easy to come get around. And we have processors which cannot be secured. Uh, As we just found out from Intel. Well, and AMD has the same problem. Yeah. It is uh, very difficult. We, yeah, we've been hearing about them almost weekly. Of different, there's been a different problem almost weekly. And well, this this goes problems. back to the problem that, in fact, processors now have a huge amount of microcode and use complexity. But there are there are other issues. Nobody ever built a. I'll take that back. 
there have been computers built to be trustable and secure. Multex was one of them. Realize Multex was uh, was running up until the mid nineties at NSA, doing okay. its job. So it wasn't a failure; just too too long to build. Right. Uh, the but it, I think when you look at where we go next, especially since we're at some point in the future, we're going to get the type of hybrid computing that that um, a conventional computing and quantum computing are going to get together. Probably not as replacements, but as as servers the way we do it now with many things. Mm -hmm. That's going to require and quant and uh, quantum networks beginning to show fairly soon at some levels, and that's going to force us to rethink everything. And it, at all levels, and it's going to be very difficult to patch. Yep. There's some really spectacular opportunities to really sort of throw everything away. That doesn't mean that you're going to throw away the hundreds of millions of people who use the internet. Yep. You, know, you know, we still use telephones. Uh, we still use uh, a lot of stuff that that's quote obsolete. Uh, but it will mean that in for many applications where even security or performance are required, we're going to have to rethink things. End of comment. Okay. Oh, I wanted to thank real briefly. I wanted to thank you, Andy, and and Dennis Allison for inviting us to present. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye.